It's been argued that Roman Emperor Constantine is the reason for the change of the seventh day Sabbath to the first day of the week, Sunday, Sabbath. And the reason why people argue this is because he made an edict in 321 AD that said this, On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and the people residing in cities rest and let all workshops be closed. You know, Constantine did in fact have a huge part in crystallizing this idea of the first day of the week being now the day of rest for Christians instead of the, the seventh day Sabbath. But this movement was already happening in the early second century, 200 years before Emperor Constantine made this edict. And it was peddled by a man named Ignatius, a bishop of a church in Antioch of Assyria. His letters were very influential in the early church and still influential today. A historian by the name of William Kellen wrote a commentary on his letters, and he had this to say about him. The epistles attributed to Ignatius have attracted greater notice and have created more discussion than any other uninspired writings of the same extent in existence. So this man recognizes that his letters have had a huge impact in the churches. And so we as believers in Yeshua, Jesus, if we are true followers of him, we will test this man, seeing that he has had a huge impact in the church as we know it today. So it's only proper that we go back and look at his letters. One of his most famous letters is his epistle to the Magnesians. And I want to, I want to read you something that he said in his epistle. If therefore those who were brought up in the ancient order of things have come to the possession of a new hope, no longer observing the Sabbath, but living in the observance of the Lord's day, on which also our life has sprung up again by him and by his death. And so Ignatius is making this argument that we no longer, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we're to no longer observe the seventh day Sabbath. We're to observe the first day of the week, referred to as the Lord's Day. Now, I will be the first one to go out into the streets, and I, and I do, and I have, and I will continue to do that, Lord willing, and stand firm in the fact, in the essential belief that Yeshua Jesus has risen from the dead. However, the argument here is that we should observe his resurrection at the detriment of the commandments of God. There's, there's a couple problems with this. One, there's nowhere in the scriptures where you will find that the believer in Yeshua Jesus is now to abandon the seventh-day Sabbath as commanded in Exodus 20 and instituted at the, at the creation week to abandon that for the first day of the week. The second reason why this is a huge issue is because we see Saul being anointed king over Israel, and he's given a commandment by the Lord through the prophet Samuel to go to the Amalekites and slay everybody and everything, even the animals, and do not spare King Agag. And so when Saul came back from battle, Samuel was there to meet him, and he said, Blessed are you and your God. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, then what is this bleeding of the sheep I hear? And his answer was that apparently he was afraid of the people, but also that he and the people wanted to give the God of Israel a sacrifice. And his sacrifice was to give him the best of the ox and the sheep. And so you see that he's trying to sincerely give this wonderful offering to the Lord, this sacrifice. The problem is it's at the detriment of the commandment. He was told not to spare any of them. And so this is a good lesson for us today. If we feel like we want to offer something to God at the detriment of his commandments, we must know that this is not acceptable to the Lord our God. And so when I hear somebody say, it's because of this good thing that we're sacrificing to God, but it's at the detriment of his commandments, I hear Saul's story ring in my mind, and it should for you as well, because Paul says that all these things are written for us for our example, that we should understand these things and not make the same mistakes. The third reason why, and I know I said a couple, but I want to add another one in there, is because if there was this dramatic change that we should no longer observe the seventh day Sabbath, but we should observe the first day of the week as a Sabbath, referred to as the Lord's Day, this would have been spoken of by the prophets. And we know that because in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, it says that surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophets, first. And so this would have been spoken of by the prophets. There would have been something dramatic, not to mention the fact that for the people of God, the Sabbath was no small matter. We have examples all over the scriptures of the people of God bringing judgment upon themselves by God for abandoning his Sabbath. Read Numbers 15. Read Nehemiah. 
So in light of that, Ignatius better be bringing out some solid biblical evidence for this change. But unfortunately, you'll find out that this reason is far from biblical. Moving on to the next part of his letter. Let us therefore no longer keep the Sabbath after the Jewish manner and rejoice in the days of idleness. For he that does not work, let him not eat. The first problem with the assessment of Ignatius here is his incorrect application of the Sabbath in that it's, quote, after the Jewish manner. Nowhere in the scriptures will you find the term Jewish Sabbath. In fact, the Bible describes the Sabbath as the Lord's Sabbath. He takes possession of it. It's his Sabbath. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 19. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, and do them. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And so we see a huge fundamental error in Christianity that they think that Jesus brings in a new Christian Sabbath and were to abandon what they refer to as the Jewish Sabbath. The idea is the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It was made as a day of rest, relaxation, and focusing attention on the Lord. So whether it's Friday, Saturday, Friday is for Muslims, Saturday for Jews, Sunday for Christians. Take your day. Take your day. Okay. You know, as you look at the New Testament, it is clear that once Jesus was raised from the dead, the early church changed its day of worship from Saturday, the last day of the week, to Sunday, the first day of the week. So again, what you'll hear from Christian ministers is that there's a Christian Sabbath, Sunday, and there's a Jewish Sabbath, Saturday, the seventh day. The problem is, in Scripture, you won't find where there's a separate Sabbath for Christians in the New Covenant and Jewish people in the Old Covenant. Nowhere in the Scripture do we find a separate rule for the Jews and the Gentiles who are coming in, being grafted into the people of Israel. We don't find two different laws, two different days to observe. In fact, we see the opposite. We see that there's actually a commandment that says, for the native and the stranger who dwells among you, there's to be one law. No, not two. This whole rule for the Jew and not for you is really not found anywhere in Scripture, and that's what Ignatius is trying to bring out here. There's no precedence for that. Isaiah chapter 56, thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for my Yeshua in Hebrew is about to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who lays hold on it who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. There goes dual covenant theology. Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am a dry tree, for thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me. Hey, by the way, the Sabbaths, they please the Lord. And hold fast my covenant, even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel says, yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. And so you see, the prophets never prophesied about this rule for the Jew and not for you. The Jews had this law, now we're changing it for the Christians and you can have this law. In fact, he talks about a future place where he will give them a name and a place better than that of sons and daughters. Something rings in my mind. I think it's John 14 where he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in also in me and my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. Where is he talking about? He's talking about the new Jerusalem. This is what this prophecy is speaking of. If you, Christian, hold fast to what pleases him, the seventh day Sabbath, you have his promise that you will have a place in his house, not because you do these things, but because you show that you want to hold fast his covenant because he has changed you because of what he has done for you because of deliverance. You want to serve him. Now, the next thing Ignatius points out here is that he says, rejoice in the days of idleness for he that does not work, let him not eat. There is the antichrist in this sentence, and I'm going to show you why. 
we have a lot of typologies in the scriptures that warn us of the future antichrist who will come who opposes and exalts himself over all that is called god or that is worshiped that paul speaks about in second thessalonians chapter 2 one of those typologies that we have in the scripture is pharaoh and i want to bring you back to exodus and show you what his response was to moses when he talked about the deliverance that the lord wanted to bring on his people what his response was to moses Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Do you know what the purpose of God wanting to deliver his people and have a feast with them? Was that they could have fellowship. They could have an appointed time where they could meet with God. Jumping down to verse 4. Then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves, and you shall lay on them the quota of bricks, which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore, they cry out saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. That's why you want to observe the instructions of God, because you're lazy, you're idle. You don't want to do anything. Get back to work. How dare you make these people not work? How dare you make them idle? And so this just drips the spirit of Antichrist and Pharaoh. And this is exactly what God is trying to tell us. This is what the Antichrist does. He doesn't want you to obey his instructions. And he makes you feel bad about doing them as well. Like you're the one who's done something wrong here. Now, now here's one of the bigger scary parts is that he actually brings out scripture as a proof text. He brings out 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 as a proof text for why you should not, as a Christian, observe the seventh day Sabbath because it makes you idle. And you should be working on that day because the scriptures say, he that does not work, let him not eat. So if you're resting on the Sabbath day, as prescribed in Exodus 20, the seventh day Sabbath, you're not to eat. And so we as Christians, we need to be able to go back to the scriptures and be good Bereans and see, is this so? Is this exactly what the Lord is trying to tell me? Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. Now, even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Straight out of the Bible. For we hear that there are some who walk among you and keep the Sabbath. Is that what he says? No, 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 no. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. So Paul's point was that these people were lazy. They were not working at all. It wasn't, ah, oh, you're keeping the Sabbath, you lazy bums. You should be working. You're idle. That wasn't Paul's point. Ignatius strikes out again. You might run into somebody who says it's not because of Ignatius. It's not because of Constantine for the reason why we made this move. It's because in the early church, the apostles, the early church was actually making this move away from seventh day Sabbath keeping to keeping the first day of the week, the Lord's day. And there's scriptures that they have as proof text for that. And we're going to look at those as well. So let's look at them and make no mistake. These are the proof texts that they will bring you to, to show you that there was a change in the Sabbath day. So here's proof text. Number one, Acts chapter 20, verse seven. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There you go. The Sabbath has changed. I mean, this is literally what they read. This is what they will say when you when when you talk about this issue. These are the scriptures they'll bring you to and say, look, it's clear. They were meeting on the first day of the week. There's an obvious change. They weren't meeting on the seventh day. The problem is we see in Acts chapter 2 that they were gathering every day of the week. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. It's like when you, when you come here, you're left with like, is there something else here? Am I missing something? What, what, what is the scripture trying to tell me? It, exactly. There's, there's really nothing here as far as that goes. Another very famous scripture that they'll bring you to is Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. This is where you get the term the Lord's day from. This is this is what they're talking about. The scripture says, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. And so this is the apostle John. He's getting the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what he refers to as a day that he's getting this revelation. He says that I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. There are two possible ways we could look at John and what he's referring to in this verse. And that is one, 
we see all over scripture that the day of the Lord refers to the second coming of Christ. I mean, that would make sense, right? We're in the book of Revelation, the, the Lord's day, the day of the Lord. And the second way is this, and I'll start with a question. Do we see any precedence for a day that the Lord claims lordship over in the scriptures? One rings a bell. Matthew chapter 12, verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. The last thing I want to bring to the table of this alleged change is Luke's gospel. Because Luke's gospel was not written contemporaneously, meaning he wasn't writing these events as they were unfolding. It's said that Luke's gospel was written three to even five decades after Yeshua Jesus' resurrection. Why is that important? Because Luke is writing these events with 2020. He's able to look back and see through the eyes of the new covenant, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit has happened in Acts 2, and he's able to see all these events with the eyes of the new covenant. And so the question is, do we see any reverence towards this first day of the week in his writings? Because if there was evidence of this change from the seventh day to the first day of the week, and we're supposed to hold this day in some sort of reverence, it would be in his writings. We do see in his writings in chapter 24, a mention of the first day of the week. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And so you see he's mentioning the first day of the week here. Now if this first day of the week is supposed to be looked at in a reverential way, it would have been right here. It should have read on the Lord's day, very early in the morning. That's how this sentence should have started if I was supposed to regard this in some sort of reverential way. But it doesn't say it. Here's something interesting to point out. Back up to chapter 23 in the last two verses. Luke chapter 23 verse 55. And the woman who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Huh. So Luke is looking back at this decades after the death and resurrection of Jesus, and he still holds the seventh day Sabbath in reverence as the commandment of the Lord. And so whether it's right in the sight of God to obey Ignatius over God, you judge.